So the sergeant, platoon sergeant, did say, Sergeant Wallace, uh, have your men place a uh, another layer of sandbags. So by this time, um, um, by the time we were ready to begin guard duty for that evening, uh, there were three layers of sandbags atop of our bunker. Uh, call signs were um, clear. Everybody knew what they were. And, and the sun is beginning to set. And, of course, in the minds of everyone, all the so soldiers is to have a, a quiet night. Um, you would always begin with um, perhaps maybe 30% um, of your uh, squad uh, on alert, on guard. The other guys could get some rest and um, make sure their weapons are fine and at the ready, your, your helmets, your flak jackets, and uh, be ready to pull your time when the other fellows were going to come off, off the line guard duty. And we're mulling around the bunker, and all of a sudden, we hear movement in the tree line. Now, the, this fire base, again, Atkinson, was a relatively um, a new base. Um, imagine from January to April, we're moving closer and closer to the Cambodian border, and, and fire bases are springing up like uh, wildflowers very quickly. And, and when a fire base is constructed, uh, you would bring, they would bring in uh, these gigantic bulldozers. We called them roan plows. And I later learned they were called roan plows because they're built in a place called Rome, Georgia. Uh, I found that out later. But these roan plows that had uh, cages on them to protect the operators, and these plows that would just simply roll over the trees, the vegetation around the fire base. And when a fire base was young, the tree line, and meaning the distance from the line bunkers to the jungle or to the trees, was maybe 100 meters. And generally, they tried to extend that out. So it gave the enemy less space to congregate to attack where they could not come in and form in the tree line. They wanted it as far away as possible. Well, for us, our line bunker at that time was the closest to the tree line where they had not been able to move out that vegetation. And that evening, we heard movement. And the movement was simply, you heard rustling and the breaking of branches. And we knew there were no patrols out. And we looked at one another, and, and I recall it was DeSantis and it was, and it was Wolf, and, and Pepe was further down. But we looked at one another, and the word was, get in the bunker. And we got in, we scrambled, grabbed our weapons, got in the bunker, and the noise increased. And it was, it was no way they were friendlies. And we opened up. And by the time we opened up, the bunkers on our right and our left flanks, they opened up too. And, um, combat now. And very quickly, the air filled up with smoke, and they began firing at us. And it was a feeling that you can't believe, because you cannot see anything. And, and you can't see anything because of the smoke that filled the air. It, was, it just blew my mind how quickly the air filled up with smoke. And um, the next thing that came to my mind was firing. Your training kicks in. And, and one of the things that kicked in your mind, they always told you, keep your fire low and then work it up. In other words, keep it, keep it close to the ground and, and, and keep it low. And then the other thing that came to my mind so very quickly was 
a sapper. And sappers were individuals who called through the Constantina wire and had satchel charges. And they would call up to your bunker and they would throw that satchel charge in. And of course, I don't need to tell you what happens when the satchel charges were thrown in, the, the position was destroyed, and those who were, were in the position. And I was afraid of them. And so every so often I would grab a firing device, we called them clackers, and squeeze off a Claymore mine, hopefully a, to prevent any sappers from coming through the wire. And we were firing and firing, and then I looked over, and uh, Wolf was firing a M60 machine gun. And um, the belt, the, the bullets for that weapon were beginning to run out. And um, I said, well, you've got to keep the M60 going. And I turned to reach for more ammo, which was in the rear of the bunker. And once I turned, there was something that just said, Wumpf. It was a muffled explosion. And, and, and once that happened, one second I'm reaching for ammo, and the next so second there's a stillness and a quietness in the bunker. I'm laying on my side and I'm trying to determine what's happened. And at that point, I felt that the bunker was going to explode again because of all of the additional ammunition and explosives that you have in the bunker. And I just knew that it was going to explode again from secondary explosions. And at this point, I said, God, if I'm dying, I'm ready to go. Uh, 